do not know his will. Oh, uh, so the difficulty is surrounding us not knowing his will. And the only way we can know his will, we have to obey and experience. Abraham had difficulty following God's will because he didn't know how God was going to carry out his will. My God, my God. You, you ever been in a situation, I know your parents have been, when you, you're telling your child something and the first thing you come out of their mouth is, why? 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 You can't always be that way with God. Huh? Even as parents, we get tired of hearing why, because we know. We know. And we know if we try to explain it to them, they may not comprehend it, so we don't want to spend the time trying to explain it to them. We want them to experience it, right? Amen. Amen. So, so Abraham, Abraham, had difficulty following God's will because he didn't know God's will and how God was going to carry out his will. But Abraham did have the discomfort of knowing but not following. Huh? So Abraham, though he did not know fully the will of God, God told him that you will have, you will bless the whole earth. The whole earth will bless you. Huh? God, matter of fact, when God first approached Abraham, he didn't tell him all those things. God gave him a little bit at a time. A little bit. Anybody been done that way? God gave you a little bit at a time. Didn't tell you the whole thing. Just told you bits and pieces of it. Just go. Just trust me. Just trust me. Just trust me. It's going to work. My God, my God. Hallelujah. He told Abraham in Genesis 22, he said, he said, Abraham, take your only son and offer him as a sacrifice. Abraham didn't have the discomfort because he heard and obeyed. Mm -hmm. There's a discomfort when you hear and don't obey. Uh -huh. huh? So Abraham didn't have a discomfort, discomfort, but because he heard God, he obeyed God. Yes, he did. But as the Lord reveals himself to us, he draws us into a relationship of trusting him without question. That's what happened with Abraham. Abraham trusted him without question. Matter of fact, Abraham's faith was such where Abraham said, me and the boy are going to go forward, but we're going to come back. Knife in his hand, wood on the boy's back, walking up the side, building up the altar. But Abraham still had the audacity to say that we're going to come back. My God, my God. Hallelujah. It is not that God doesn't want, doesn't know what we will do. It's not that God doesn't know what we will do. He knows. He proves us so that we also know. We also know ourselves. We also know our limitations. We also know our lack of faith. Huh? As you grow day by day, it doesn't mean you will not have challenges. You're going to have challenges. Things are going to come before you. The, 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 the temptations are going to come before you. My God, my God. All of these things are going to come before you. You're going to have these challenges. I heard the Sister Shaver saying this morning, and this is the truth. Jesus did not pray that we not, would not go through. He prayed that we would make it through. Huh? We would make it through those challenges that constantly come at us. My God, my God. As God reveals himself to you, you learn to trust him. You grow day by day. Day by day. And as you grow day by day, you're going to have challenges. Your challenge is going to make you strong. Yes. Huh? You will grow, though. <clears throat> but your trust in God will trump your human tendency to worry. Mm -hmm. When you trust him, you don't worry. Yes. Huh? You don't worry. Which means that when you trust God, no matter how dire the situation seems, you don't sit up and rehash the problem. All the time. You just say, Lord, and you I live and you I die. And I move forward by your power and your anointing. And Lord, you told me, you told me to do this. Because you told me to do. Oh, my, 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 my God. Hallelujah. God always does one thing, though. He asks us for what is dear to us. What's most dear to us. Because he knows that's the hardest thing that we have. What's most dear to us. God won't necessarily ask you for your child, but he'll ask you for your money today. Oh, and that causes a crisis of belief. My God. 
when he asks you for something that's near and dear to you, it's not because God needs it. Not when he's riding around on gold. He doesn't need your stuff. But it's a matter of you obeying him. It's a matter of you showing forth that you trust him. My God, my God. It's a matter because he's given it all to you in the first place, and he's only asking back for a little bit of it. My God. I can be honest now. When I, when I first started tithing, 20 some years ago, it was hard. It was hard to let go of that 15, 10% rather. It was hard, extremely hard. Matter of fact, what I was doing until I learned better, I would type only on my net. I was having the audacity to let the government get theirs before God got here. Huh? I learned from that, man. It just blessed me. It just blew me away when I learned from that. When I learned, and, and the Lord said, give me my due. Huh? When I start tightening on the growth, not worrying about it. Right. Tightening on the growth. Huh? And when I start tightening on the growth, my income begins to double. It begins to double. It begins to double. It just, I'm telling you, it was just supernatural the way God did that. The income begins to just grow and grow and grow. Hallelujah. And then I, 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 the devil tried, tried to make me stop. He brought a crisis before me where I needed the money. But instead of me stopping, I went forth and gave 15%. Huh? And I kept on giving. I just kept on giving until I got up to 20-some percent. And each step that I took in trust, in connection with the Lord, he blessed. Amen. He blessed. When I left Virginia coming in this direction, my pastor was still Pastor Herman Crockett. Dr. Crockett was my pastor. I left Virginia coming in this direction and I got this lump sum of money from the sale of my house. And I came down in this direction. I was supposed to use that money to make a down payment on my new house. Hallelujah. But at the time of us leaving, Pastor Crockett was getting ready to do a building. Uh, he was doing a chair drive. He wanted to replace his chairs. I was on my way down here with money to put a down payment on my house, and the Lord spoke to me in a hotel in Tennessee. He said, you call Pastor Crockett, and you send him an offering of what you just got. And I was like, well, Lord, I ain't going to have the money to pay. He said, you call Pastor Crockett, and you, I was like, okay, yes, Lord. I obeyed, and I began to experience the move of God like never before. There was more benefits that I didn't know about once I got to my assignment. They began to write more checks to me. They began to give me more, oh my gosh. You, you gotta understand, when, oh, when I took the job, I took it and I had to take a pay cut. I had to take a slight pay cut when I took the job. My wife had to leave her long-term teaching job to go with me. So we, it seemed like we would have ended up hurting but we didn't miss one beat. Do it look like I'm starving? Huh? Didn't, oh, I heard that. We didn't miss one beat. Blessings, my God, my God. Not, not a beat. They, they had given me a bonus to sign on in my previous company. The postal service came and matched it dollar for dollar. And I didn't miss a thing. And it was all because I said, Lord, I'm going to obey you. I'm going to obey you because I know I've seen how you work before in the past. If I obey you, I'm going to experience my God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Next one is taking God at his word. You've got to believe God. You've got to believe him, my God. The, the beauty of God's plan uh, is his obedience to his own will. That's the beauty of his plan. You know, if you believe him and take him at his word, his will will be done in your life. His will means that, that, that we are not to consider ourselves counselors of God. Yes. Stop trying to counsel God and tell God what it is that you want him to do for you. Or what you want him to have you do. Take the counsel of God. God has already said that I do not need your counsel. I'm almighty. I'm sovereign. I know what I'm doing. I've been to the beginning and the end of a situation, so I already know the outcome of it. 
We find ourselves doing just that though. We have to understand that God works within his will and he invites us into his perfect will. Jesus once told his disciples, go fishing for money. What? Fishing for fish? No, go fishing for money. Go fishing for money. But not to catch the fish, but to get money. Not to catch the fish and sell the fish, but to get money. Not to look, not to catch the fish and get a smelly smell of fish on you, but to get the money. He said, catch the fish. And when you catch the fish, look in his mouth. And then you look in his mouth, you're not going to find a hook. When you look in his mouth, you're not going to necessarily find seaweed. Huh? When you look in the fish mouth, you're going to find money. Huh? Let you know how, how, how little value money is. Lord will allow money to grow in a fish's mouth. Huh? My God. And Jesus said, when you look in the fish's mouth, you're going to find something unexpected. Oh, my God. Hallelujah. If the disciples would only have just came with expectancy. And whatever Jesus said, they just did it without hesitation. Huh? Jesus' mother knew that, that you should follow his rule and do it without hesitation. That's why we had the first recorded miracle. Now, I said the first recorded miracle as her telling the people at the feast to do whatever he said. I don't care how crazy it sounds, do whatever he said. Sometimes God tells you to do things that sound crazy. <laughs> it sounds real crazy. What? Give up that much money? What you mean, Lord, just let turn the other cheek? Lord, they may hit me in that one too. But you've got to trust God because God knows what he's doing. You have to take him at his word. My God, my God, my God. To me, you got to believe God stronger than what even Mary believes nowadays because it's a challenge today. Huh? You got to believe him. You got to believe him. God being the same God means that the blessing that he poured out to the people in the Bible are ours. They're ours. And even more. And even more. And even more. But we miss out because we get so caught up running from place to place, hearing all these strange winds of doctrine. If you find yourself running, you're going to hear some crazy stuff. You're going to hear some crazy stuff that's not even of God. Huh? If you find yourself running, you'll start hearing, hearing things such as the sensation, the cessation doctrine that says that no miracles exist today. Huh? There's a church that teaches that, that no miracles exist today. There's a church that teaches that there are no more apostles today. There's a church that teaches those things. It says that tongues don't even work. And how many know that you can begin to use your heavenly language and get breakthroughs that'll blow your mind? I've never read really know in the Bible where it says that God can bless you. Hallelujah. Next thing is obedience is love. Jesus once said that if you are my sheep, then you will hear my voice. He says that you're my sheep. Why aren't you following me? Peter, you said that, uh, that I'm your shepherd. But Peter, I told you to stop fishing for fish and fish for men. Why are you doing something contrary to what I said to Peter? He said, Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. If you love me, feed those who I sent you to go to. Go to fishing after those that, Peter, you are a leader in the body. And Peter, when you said, I go a fishing, everyone else went a fishing with you. I put that ability inside of you, Peter, in order to lead people into me, not into the boat. I saw this video one time where it had a bunch of sheep in a pasture. Had sheep from several shepherds in a pasture. And this was this is real. Had sheep from several shepherds in a pasture. And they left them there overnight so they became familiar with each other, so on and so forth. Then the next day they brought a shepherd out. That one shepherd may have had 10 sheep or whatever and probably a hundred sheep in there. That one shepherd said, come on. And when he said, come on, 10 sheep walked out of there, 90 stayed. Huh? 
Same as us. When the Lord calls us and tells us to come on, we've got to learn to come on. Yes. And go with what God is calling us to do. Huh? Those sheep, those sheep had mingled with the air the other sheep. They knew the other sheep. They smelled like the other sheep. They looked like the other sheep. But when their shepherd called them, immediately they departed from the other sheep and they followed their shepherd. Why? Because they knew the voice of their shepherd. Jesus caught this natural tendency and applied to spiritual realities. The only reason the sheep follow is because though they heard the voice of the other shepherds, they did not know or trust the other shepherd. The sheep loved their shepherd, and out of their love came forth obedience. Jesus reflected on this by saying in John 15, 13, No greater love has any man than this, than a man who lays down his life for a friend. Lays down his life for a friend. The Lord Jesus calls us to be his flock. And our response may not begin out of love. It may be downright out of fear, intimidation. It may be downright out of pride. It may be downright a desire to please others. But a genuine repentance can be a catalyst for your overall salvation. But as you grow in grace, your response should be not out of fear. It should be out of love. Lord, I love you. Can anyone say today that they love the Lord? Amen. 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 Can anyone say today that they have served the Lord with their whole heart all the time? No. Not many can say that. Can anyone say today that they've led someone to Christ even on this week? Huh? Not many can say that. But the word tells us if you love me, if you love me, you're going to do my will. You love me, you're going to obey what I said. If you love me, it would just bother you so much knowing these people are on their way to hell and you can make a difference in their life. The final thing, power and perseverance. Now for those who don't know, shh, living this Christian life ain't easy. In case you didn't know, it can be challenging. Can you imagine pouring out Sacrificing, giving up things for the walk. My God, can you imagine pushing forward those you're trying to help, not wanting to help you? Huh? Those you're trying to help, putting on lids? Huh? The more you put out, the more they just take in. Huh? But regardless, you still must endure. You still must love. Huh? What about you when you were in that state? When you were unlovable, he yet loved you. Huh? What about you? Let's examine the Great Commission in light of this. In light of what the world would say. Jesus said, go ye. The world says, if you feel like it. Jesus said, into the world. The world says, to only those you feel comfortable with. Huh? Jesus said and preached the gospel. The world says spread the gospel. Yes. You get the picture? Yes. We as Christians yes. must not only be committed, but we must be focused on what's really important. It's not important how many likes you get, how many tweets you get. It's, that's not important because that's not going to get anyone into glory. Huh? It just gets you excited, but in your excitement, you can be excited and go right to hell. We as Christians must be focused, focused, focused on the mission and not the people. Focused on the mission and not the people. Don't worry about hurting someone's feeling when you tell them the truth. Amen. Tell them the truth and move on. Yes. Love them throughout it. There's a way of presenting the truth, whereas they know that it's out of love. And there's also a way you can present the truth and it feels wrong. If you focus on people, you are sure to get unfocused on the mission. You find many who are committed, but not focused. Committed means, okay, I'm coming to church every Sunday. But not picking up a thing when they come to church. Before they even get out of the church good, they get a selfie on, on uh, Facebook saying something crazy. Huh? My God, my God. Committed, because every Sunday you come to church, every Wednesday you come to church, but not focused. 
Huh? Not focused to the purpose of your commitment. Huh? 